Hi everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today I'm at the Blue Mountains Botanic Garden in Mount Teumer. It's one of three botanic gardens in Sydney. It's actually the highest botanic garden in all of Australia and the high altitude is perfect for cool climate plants. With the beginning of spring there is a lot of flowers in bloom but I know absolutely nothing about flowering plants. So today I'm gonna join Matt Murray, horticulturalist at the Botanic Garden Sydney to learn more about what this garden has to offer. Alrighty, so we're gonna go meet Matt now. Um, but I wanted to have a sneaky little look at the daffodils already. So I think daffodils is really like the main thing, but there should also be some tulips. And I already saw a lot of natives in bloom as well. Now this is not an exclusive tour just for us today. There's other people joining the tour as well and it just happens once a year. So we need to be respectful of everybody else, but I'm gonna try and get as much footage and inside knowledge uh, out of Matt as possible. Also, this is in the mountains. So it's about an hour and a half away from uh, where I live. So from the city center. And because it's, uh, it's actually the highest botanic garden in all of Australia, so altitude-wise. And obviously with height comes cooler temperatures. So even just an hour and a half out of Sydney, we are facing completely different challenges. We have a completely different climate over here, which suits a different kind of plant. So yeah, it's something I have absolutely zero experience with, but I think this year is all about learning new things and that's exactly what we're doing today. Look at these, we're definitely gonna come back for all of these beautiful natives as well, but I'm running a bit late <laughs> because I tried to film the intro like five times. <laughs> so let's go. So this is the Blue Mountains Botanic Gardens, Mount Toma. It's the cold climate annex of uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens. So primarily up here we grow cold climate plants or plants that need um, a bit of uh, winter chill uh, that may not grow particularly well in Sydney. Yeah. So the gardens itself is actually quite huge. It's in two sections. So you can see this section here, which is what we call the cultivated area of a garden, um, is 45 hectares. And over the road, you can see sort of that wilderness area. Yeah. That's the larger area of the gardens. That's also us. Um, and that's 120 hectare. That's our natural area. So, now the two sections are actually quite different. The cultivated section is on bas basalt, which is a rich volcanic rock. You can see this spiral here is made out of basalt <coughs> and over the road it's all sandstone. So you have very different um, growing conditions up here than what you get over the road. So. Also, the gardens themselves is just on a thousand meters, so it's quite a big rise up from uh, the plains below, and that's what gives us our cooler weather. And we also tend to get a lot more rain here too, because the well, it's an, an easterly today. It catches as it as it comes up. So, um, alrighty. What I will do is we will wander our way through the garden and have a little bit of a loop and then uh, end up looking at the daffodils in the meadow. All right. Okay. Our first stop is, this is a tree fern and uh, Toma is actually the local direct name word for um, tree fern. So originally Mount Toma was called Mount Tree Fern and it's very appropriate because these grow everywhere here. Of course they like it, it's a bit cooler and wetter up yeah. here. We have lots and lots of ferns up here at Mount Toma. Um, so there you go, Toma Tree Fern. So this is the residence garden and the idea of a garden was that um, it was to display what you could do in your own home backyard um, somewhere in a cool climate. So we have lots and lots of different plants that would be, you know, very successful. We have lots of camellias. This is Camellia japonica, which is uh, just starting to come into its peak now. So, and they do really well up here too. I'll show you our latest um, development, which is uh, quite exciting, a huge camellia garden just down below. 
In the garden I've hidden a few little surprises, I suppose. So just, just to talk about, one of the things I always like to talk about is what they call form and function of plants. Why their flowers are that colour or that shape or their leaves or whatever. So I also like to talk about the names. How did plants get their names? Because they're, they're called descriptive names. So this is anemone, but it's an anemone. Anemone refers to the wind because the, the plants often grow in windy places. But this one is called blander. Blander sounds, you know, like it's boring or tiresome or whatever, but blander actually means that it's cute or pleasing um, because botanic, botanic names come from Greek or from Latin um, and sometimes, you know, like Turkish, so it, it draws all those names in. But this is actually a Greek name. So anemone and blander meaning cute or pleasing. So you can see it's a blue flower. One of the things is that many flowers, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, because they flower in late winter or early spring when the light's not very strong or there's a lot of cloud, are often blue, white or yellow. So, you know, insects don't see things in exactly the same way as us. They use ultraviolet light. And under low light, blue, white and yellow really glow. So the, the much more dramatic colours like red don't, grow, don't, don't show as well under dull light. So the first flowers, particularly in cold climates, are often blue, yellow or white. Now this is another little early spring flowering bulb. This is called the Glory of the Snow or Kionodoxa. Kion is the Greek name for um, snow and doxa means flower. So it's a little blue flower that pushes up through the snow when it's melting. And as I said, the flowers are blue, so they're really bright. Okay. And here's another one. This is a daffodil, of course, but this is the smallest one of them all. So these are all hybrids, so they've been bred from all the wild species daffodils, but this one is actually a wild species. This is called Narcissus asturiensis. Daffodils originally came from Spain and North Africa. So Asturias is a mountain range in Spain. Um, but you can see, it's a little tiny cute thing. So, okay, we don't need to go far, because I'll talk about this. Now, I, I've spoken about flower colour being quite important in low um, light areas, but also so is the shape. Because as you can imagine, in those sort of areas, the weather's not very nice in spring or, or winter. So a lot of the early flowering plants have this sort of hanging down shape because the rain's pouring and they obviously don't want to have the flowers damaged. So this is a pyrus, which is called pier. Um, a pearl flower and it has these beautiful sort of hanging down um, flowers and they, they're having a fantastic year. Now um, spring is coming super fast here at Mount Tomar. This is a, a whopping big um, weeping cherry and you can see it's already coming into flower so it's also one of the most amazing plants in the gardens. It's beautiful um, but yeah it's, it's, it's really rushing things through so I would say within another week or so this will be in full flower. So you can see this is um, originally this was the residence for uh, the boss who uh, used to live on site so lucky lucky them this is uh, where they lived so um, but probably about 10 years ago they uh, they moved them off site and um, yeah, this is the residence. So we use it as accommodation for visitors. Um, we often have botanists or horticulturalists coming from other botanic gardens and this is where they stay. Pretty nice if you ask me. This is another little bulb. This one of course is called um, Bluebells. So this is the Spanish Bluebell, which is Andymion Hispanica. Um, and it's a little different from the English one. The English one's kind of nicer. It's much bigger and uh, m really highly scented, but the Spanish one does much better in Australian conditions. Again, you can see the hanging down sort of bells and the blue. Um, and the name Andy Myon was named after uh, a, a, a shepherd who uh, w was 
often appeared in uh, Greek mythology. He was one of the sort of favourite um, of the God, shepherd of the gods. So that's how this plant got its name, Endymion. This is a plant called Helleborus. Mm -hmm. So there's lots and lots of different Helleborus, but this is um, Helleborus lividus. And they always have really similar flowers. Again, as I said, they're kind of quite sombre sort of colours with those hanging down bells. And Helleborus are um, also quite sinister because they're they're, they're really toxic. So they used to use them in medieval times for um, fixing people that they didn't like. Yeah. So whenever we're doing anything with them, because we, we cut them back, not this particular one, um, we cut them back. We always wear gloves and stuff. Um, but they're a very popular garden plant. And they're wonderful because they flower in, in winter. So, yeah. As I said, we have lots and lots of ferns at Mount Toma, and this is another one. Can you see this thing here? This is called a thumbnail fern, or it's also called pyrosia. And we find them here, they grow over the trees, over the rocks, they're super tough. And they get their name, I'm just trying to find a little leaf. They get their name from the very thumbnail shaped okay. sort of leaves so these things are incredibly tough they can go for ages without water and they just kind of shrivel up um, and look terrible and then as soon as they get some water they just plump up and off they go again so these are what they call epiphytes so epiphytes use the tree only for support so they don't they don't do any anything at all so they just kind of grow over it Oh, I can't find any fertile fronds. Must be too early. Yeah, normally underneath there's sort of like these these dots. Oh yeah, here we go. Thank you. You're obviously slightly taller than me. See, so, yeah, you can see. Yeah, that's what that's what they call sporangia. No, yeah, no, it does look like rust, but that's what they call sporangia. That's where the the spores or like the seeds of um, ferns are held. So, yeah, just kind of the wind calms and off they drift and uh, find something else to uh, to land on. So, yeah, pyrosias. As I mentioned, we have lots and lots of camellias here, and all different sort of shapes and sizes but can you see this this one's what they call a sport so it's actually a mutation it's somewhere back in there the cells have become a little bit different from this the parent and created a sport you can see the different color and that's how a lot of new cultivars arise is somebody will go oh that's real nice I'll propagate that and then of course there's a new plant so I said to um, to my boss the other day because she's an expert on camellias what do you think do you, would you like to prop it and she goes no nah, I think that there's plenty of other camellias you know even nicer than that but I said look I'll leave it on the plant and we'll just talk about what they call sports or new cultivars so you can see this one up here is quite a different species again these are quite small. This is Camellia reticulata. Um, in a, like when we had all that rain, the flowers were like dinner plate sized. It's one of the largest flowering of all the camellias and it has this really sort of silken texture to it. Um, it's not as like tight a plant as the Camellia japonica, but it has these beautiful flowers. So, and if you just turn around, you can see all this very, uh, I think it's horrible looking, but this orange fencing. Now that's our latest garden area. So they're developing a huge Camellia collection here. And that's where it's going. This is what they call stage one. There's actually three stages which will spread around the mountain and it's to show off camellias, not just all these ones, but there's, there's many different species. There's yellow ones, um, little tiny ones too. So this will be our new camellia garden. All right, so I want to talk about snowdrops and snowflakes. So these are leucogems, which are known as snowflakes. 
Can you see them? They're white with six petals that are all the same length. And these are snowdrops, which are really closely related, but they have three petals that are long and three that are short. So that's the difference between snowdrops and snowflakes. Magnolia, so of course this is magnolia. This is a wonderful um, cultivar called Genie. So, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a hybrid, so it's got unusual dark flowers. But what I'll do is we'll just scoot around here. And as we're going, you can see we have lots and lots of bulbs. This whole area is actually bulbs. This is our bulb meadow. Um, and it's sort of in the latter stages of, uh, of flowering. Down below were heaps and heaps of crocus, like thousands of crocus. Um, but crocus are much earlier flowering. So then it transitions up here. So you get this amazing sort of carpet of what they call um, spring star flowers and daffodils and, and of course all your, um, your snowflakes too. So and these plants just come up disappear and self-seed and um, spread themselves around so and obviously they love being underneath these uh, big oaks here this is part of our magnolia collection over there the rest of the collection is so we won't go that far but um this one's particularly coming into bloom of course it's on the sunny side so it tends to be a little bit earlier so this is magnolia stellata stellat means um, star flowers so it does it looks very starry flower now magnolias are also one of the most primitive of plants too you know there's difference between conifers conifers are uh, non-flowering plants whereas magnolias are, are flowering plants and recently they discovered one of its ancient relatives is growing in um, in Borneo one of the botanic botanists from um, Sydney Botanic Gardens discovered the plant and he believes that this is one of the first of the plants that flower so insects developed around about the same time and um, then this magnolia relative which is tropical because magnolias originally come from the tropics um, develop too so these are amongst the most primitive flowering plants you can see they're pretty simple you know just petals with um, some some uh, stamens and, and stigmas in there so there you go there's magnolias and it's they're also quite beautiful with these furry silky buds so all this fur is to kind of persuade things they're not very nice to eat. Yeah, it gets caught in their mouths or they're, uh, they're not very tasty. Um, of course, possums love them. So yeah, I've, I've got a big magnolia at home and hardly ever flowers because the possums get into it. Yeah, but uh, that's one of the uh, joys and drawbacks of having a garden in the middle of a, of a national park. So yeah, yep. Um, anyway. That's magnolias. And it's interesting because quite often when I'm heading to Sydney in August, they're in full flower in Sydney and not even starting here. They always start. There's like a wave of magnolias that, that goes up the mountain. So, and these days they come in all different colors. There's even yellow ones too. So yeah, but they, they are, they're, they're beautiful. And yeah. So we have obviously lots of daffodils here. Originally this garden was a cut flower farm um, back in the 1940s and 1950s. It was owned by a, uh, a French couple who used to, who used to grow um, cut flowers for the Sydney market and this was their site for all the, uh, the cold climate plants. So yeah and a lot of them are still remnants from these days like all these um all these jonquils and these jonquils they're all leftovers from um from the brunette um yeah family they do yeah yep and it's interesting because some people love it and other people don't yeah you know i think it's just personal taste They've almost finished, but remember the plant up the top? These are the Hellebores, but this is a different species here. This is Hellebores orientalis. Um, and it's a bit more 
kind of pleasant looking than uh, than Lividus up the top. So as I said, when we're sort of cutting it back, because they set heaps of seed, um, you can see just the seed capsules. And if we miss them, they self-see. So when the flower's finished, we normally just cut them back and that way then we get rid of it. But we always wear gloves and stuff. So yeah, just to make sure that we don't end up poisoned from it. Now I, I spoke a little bit about um, hyacinths. So unfortunately the white ones haven't started to flower in this patch here, but um, I planted the blues and whites to get, a, to get a kind of contrast. So these are what they call the florist hyacinths. So they're, they're big, highly scented and last a long time. Now hyacinth I used to think was a female name but it's actually a male name. So Hyacinthus was a very favorite, um, a favorite of the god Apollo. And so that's how it got its name. When, when Hyacinth is passed on, he became a Hyacinth. And uh, that's how it, 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 got its, it got its name. And of course, I think I much prefer the smell of hyacinths to uh, to jonquils so and they last a long time like here they we just leave them in bulbs have uh, contractile roots so they actually have special roots that go down into the soil and the roots are like almost like a concertina so the concertina collapses and it pulls the bulb down to where it wants to be so that's why you don't really have to plant a lot of bulbs too deep They'll just do their own thing and pull themselves down. Here we go. <coughs> this is one of our earliest flowering um, rhodos. These are a group called Madonize. Madonize are almost semi-tropical um, flowers because they come from warmer areas through, uh, through Asia and India, but they are often highly scented. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, one, this one's not as strongly scented as some of the others um, but it's one of the distinguishing feature of of these group of um, rhododendrons and they also have very distinctive bark it's a bit hard to see because this one's quite dense they have really flaky sort of looking bark um, but they're they're all got big almost orchid like flowers and highly scented they're beautiful and they're they're really good growers in Sydney too so they don't like super cold climates <laughs> um, they much prefer kind of intermediate climates and yeah no, they grow quite happily in Sydney so this is the top of our rock garden which is a really large rock garden I think it's uh, one of the largest in the southern hemisphere so we'll just sort of skirt along the top of it um, because it, it's more sort of late winter, late, late spring, uh, summer flower, flowering. But traditionally rock gardens, because mountains often have streams through them, this is the stream that, that runs through the rock garden. Gives it that kind of wilderness effect with the water. Uh, and it's, it's entirely recycled, just pumps from the top, bottom to the top keeps going around. I mentioned about the local rock. This is basalt and this is the reason why the soil is so fertile. But where it and it's very distinctive because it always has these almost circular prisms and so whenever we're digging in the soil this is what we dig up. We almost all of the basalt that we use on this site has come from here where we've been digging I just found these crystals, they call them, in the, in the ground. And we use it for all our buildings and walls and stuff. It's very handy. So traditionally botanic gardens are divided into uh, what they call botanical or geographical um, themes. So this is our South African theme. South Africa, Australia, New Zealand and South America all, all once joined together into a big landmass that they call Gondwana. So a lot of Australian plants look very similar to a lot of the, the South American and South African plants, particularly what they call proteaceous plants, which banksias, waratahs, grevilleas are all proteaceous plants. And a lot of the South African proteaceous plants look really similar to ours. But proteaceous plants, even though this is not a particularly stunning, spectacular one, 
often have really brightly coloured flowers, so reds or, or bright yellows or oranges. And the reason why they do that is because birds are attracted to those colours. So almost all proteaceous plants are pollinated by birds. So that's why they have such tough flowers. Yeah, because birds are, are not gentle. They're, they're, <laughs> they're quite rough when they're, they're foraging for the nectar. So we'll have a look at some of the, uh, the proteas. These are all the native ones, obviously with the grevilleas. We have a really large display of waratahs, which haven't started. But again, you can see those bright red flowers. So whenever I see bright red flowers, I instantly suspect that's bird pollinated. So again, because they, they don't look at the world in the same, you know, sort of way that we do. These are colours that are really attractive to them. They say there's lots and lots of honey because, of course, that's what they're after. OK. Let's have a little wander up here. Now, this is a classic protea, and um, proteas are all quite very variable. Proteaceae is incredible, they look very different. Now, protea was named after a god called Proteus whose special power was that he could change his, his form so that he could evade his enemies or confuse his enemies. And it's a very appropriate name for Proteaceae because they're so different. Like this one looks quite different to uh, some of these up here too. But again, you can see brightly coloured and really tough. And there's a bit of sugar in there too. So, but this is um, Protea cyanoroides, which is the king protea. But this is a small form of it called Little Prince. Um, they have almost the largest flowering uh, flowers of all Proteaceae. So, and it's also one of the easiest one to grow too. All right. Okay. Um, this is. Uh, South African, so we have a lot of succulents, including these aloes. And again, you can see, look at the flowers, they're quite brightly coloured. They too are also bird pollinated. We often see birds on these looking for, um, for, uh, for nectar. Um, I particularly love about proteas is this softness that they have. You know, it's just almost like teddy bears, I think. So, yeah, but again, yeah, be careful, there's bees in them. So, of course, being a really nice warm day, bees are going nuts, I think, which is great. This is, uh, this is a helichrysum or an everlasting daisy. So, um, it's quite interesting because whenever you see things with silver leaves, it generally means they come from full sun areas. Because silver, what it does, it reflects the light back off. The, um, the leaf and um, stops them from drying out. Silvery or furry, like you feel this and it's actually got quite sort of um, furry leaves. But this one is called uh, Helichrysum agrifolium. Now you, you've heard of the, the word agro, you know, agro person or whatever, meaning angry. Um, it also means crazy. So this is agrifolium and that means it has crazy foliage because the foliage all twists and turns in different ways. So yeah, and quite often when people are asking, you know, about cultivation tips, if it has silver leaves, I always say best in full sun. So yeah, you can see like this is another little one here and it also has silver leaves too. Um, this also is another proteaceous plant. These are uh, leucodendrons. So they're not really grown so much for their spectacular flower because the flower itself is actually quite insignificant and a little boring. But they have these beautiful bracts around the flowers and they tend to last much longer than proteas in, um, in flower. So, but they're always um, quite spectacular um, flowers and forms. So I was talking about the King Protea. So this is the fully sized one, Protea cyanoroides. Um, do you know artichokes? Mm -hmm. Artichokes is cyanara, and apparently the shape of that is very similar to the flower of, a, of an artichoke. 
but they're huge whoops and there's a bee in there yeah huge beautiful silky flowers so they really are absolutely great and one of the few proteas that will grow in heavier soils the people who are often asking oh what would be good in a uh, kind of semi clay soil and this is one that will actually do quite nicely and they love coastal areas too because they grow around the coast in south africa This is one of my favourite proteas. I love this. It's beautiful, yeah, white satin mink. I think when I was a kid, my my um, parents' place, their neighbour had uh, pl had one like this, and it always reminds me of being a kid. You know, I'm going, mm, I love it. There's many different um, ericas from South Africa, and of course through Europe and and stuff. You can see all these different ones. Here, but they all look quite similar too, you know, with these what they call ursulate, um, campanulate flowers. Um, but yeah, this is one that flowers for months and months and months and months. It's really wonderful. So, yeah, yeah, it looks like kind of clouds of pink, doesn't it? So, yeah, but it, it looks really nice at this time of year. Okay, so this is the area that is known as the Brunette Garden, who were the original owners of this property. And their house was just here. Um, and you can see these trees, which are walnuts, were all planted in a row. And that was actually the driveway, which came in there and came up here. And their sort of cut flower nursery farm was all in that direction over there. So, um, and in this area we grow of course plants kind of you know to commemorate their really wonderful gift because they they bequeath this whole area to the the Royal Botanic Gardens back in the 1970s so yeah and we started it as a as a proper botanic garden as a bicentennial um, project I think it was the first one that opened in 1987 so and of course they used to grow lots and lots of uh, daffodils as cut flowers. So this is why we have so many in here. Um, do you know how Narcissus got its name? Yeah, of course, it's always the gods. Always the gods. Yeah, well, Narcissus was a, a youth who was um, pretty good looking. And so he used to think that he was super cute. He spent his days looking at his reflection, admiring himself. Yeah, in a in a pond, and of course, I mean, you can only do that for so long before you, well, you know, you end up dying. So when he passed away, up popped a narcissus, and uh, that's given us this range of narcissus. So there's lots and lots and lots. I think there's 14 different types, what they call classes of daffodils, um, and this is. Obviously, this is a classic, of course, um, which is the trumpet daffodil. But there's lots of different types. You can see these ones, which they call small cups. Um, and these, which are sort of in between that and that. So they're kind of median cups. You, you get the idea. They're mostly named after what the, the shape of this, which is called the perianth, the center of the flower, um, and just generally it's sort of shape and also on its size too. Because as I showed you, daffodils come in all different, different sizes from the tiny ones through to these, um, well, these much larger ones. Daffodils is what they call a common name. Okay. So common names kind of, is very, what would you say, like kind of um, not, it, it's a blanket term. So yeah, Narcissus refers to all of them. So this is a Narcissus, that is a Narcissus. Um, like for example, you know, daffodils kind of generally cover these ones, but then there's the jonquils, of course. And then there's paper whites, which are sort of the white ones too, a little bit like um, jonquils. And then of course there's the hoop petticoats. So it's the, this is the thing with common names. They kind of give you a general idea. And also from country to country or even state to state, they vary. So, um, but Narcissus covers them all. 
So, it's similar to azaleas and rhododendrons. Azaleas are, are rhododendrons, but of course most people know them as azaleas or rhododendrons. This area is about to undergo a big renovation because one of the important things with daffodils is you need to divide them up every four to five years. So you can see quite large sections through there where there's not much flowering. Um, next year we're going to dig them all up um, and divide them and, and um, spread them all out. Because what happens is they, they exhaust the soil in certain areas and um, this this allows some fresh soil and then they'll they'll bloom again so yeah uh, it's it's time to renovate this area also daffodils to some people um, can be cause skin irritations so yeah the sap's a little bit um, irritating to people with quite sensitive skin so we'll have a little wander around and have a look at some of the different types so you can see this one it's what they call a pheasant eye um, it's a daffodil that actually occurs in the UK called Narcissus poeticus and it, it occurs near wet areas so it actually likes a bit more moisture but it always has that really sort of distinctive eye and is often not so much on these ones quite highly scented too there's also these ones which are what they call double narcissus they're kind of weird looking but some people like them so oh and you can see these little ones here, these are what they call kind of intermediates. They're not truly miniature, um, but, they're, uh, but they're sort of not as big as the other. We have um, pink flowering ones here too, which are quite nice, but pink flowering ones only get a good colour pink in cold places. They need the real cold to sort of develop it. In Sydney they look more like kind of a papery brown, which is not so attractive. Oh, here we go. Ugh. You can see this one. It's kind of pinkish. Yeah, it's not true pink, but sort of more, I don't know, brickish pink, maybe? So, yeah, but as I said, I used to try them in um, Sydney and they were always brown, not, not very attractive. I think these ones are a little bit more sort of pink. They're quite sweet. Mm. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really unusual, I think. Oh, and uh, what we normally do with, with this area is after the daffodils finish, we'll give them a feed um, and we leave them till the, the leaves start to die back, which is generally around about November. With bulbs, it's important to let the leaves grow for as long as possible. That way, then they're big enough to flower the following year. So it looks quite untidy through here until about mid-November and then we come through and mow and it just returns back to the turf that it was. So yeah, because you often see people tying daffodil leaves up, which, which is not good for them. You know, it kind of reduces their uh, ability to feed for the next year. So yeah. You have early ones, then you have mid-season ones, and then you have late ones. So you get kind of that staggered display. So, yeah, the, like this is probably about midway through the season. Um, so I'd say another two to three weeks. And it's all dependent on the weather. If we get suddenly hot, dry winds, then that really speeds up their um, demise. So, yeah. Thanks, Matt. Oh, no worries. You're so welcome. Nice. Yeah, Thank not a problem. So, so, have you been here before? No. I've been here before. I oh, go God. to the, you know, the one in the yeah, city Sydney. quite a lot. Um, like, just five kilometers away from there. Yeah. So, I go there every couple of weeks almost. Yeah. Uh, yep. But, yeah, this is really nice. Like, this year, I really want to step outside of my comfort zone a little bit, learn more yeah, about plants yeah, yeah. in general, not just like stick to my niche. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's really nice to learn from, from experts, right? And it's yeah. like somebody who's dedicated their whole life to a specific yeah. area and then learn from them. And, you know, yeah, yeah, there. of like, course. Well, just kind of gets you around, gives you a much broader base of yeah. uh, interesting plants. And, yeah, and, 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 and appreciation for yeah, nature as course. well, right? Like I see like the, the houseplants is definitely like a stepping stone, like bringing yeah. nature into the apartment being surrounded yep. by it ever since I started that hobby I just have 
so much more appreciation yeah. for plants. Like we're on the highway and I'm just like, look, a wattle, look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, whereas before I feel like I was just blindly walking through the world, just completely uh, yeah. unaware. And now yep. I just actually appreciate it more. I think also yeah. too, you tend to start off with one group of plants yeah. and then just slowly kind yeah, of grow. You like it and exactly. it starts to grow, you know, and yeah. you'll be like, oh, I didn't know. There were suddenly orchids or yes. whatever. And the next thing, of course, you make in on orchids. So well, I just yeah. got my first garden this year. I moved oh, to right. an apartment. I have two little garden areas now. So Great. I can start a bit of outdoor gardening as oh, well. But cool. I do have two really big eucalyptus trees. That All right. Are, like, mm, that's a tough. Tricky. So um, see how I go. Yeah. But, you know, it's well, interesting stepping, stepping out of the comfort zone. Yeah, no, new, I agree. So. Yeah, do so. you think this time of the year is like the peak? Where like this is like... Of here? You, yeah. Mm. Or what's your what's your favorite season? Over my here? God, I think autumn is my autumn? favorite. Oh, autumn here is really nice. nice. Traditionally, around about Anzac Day, you know, so yep. late April, it's really spectacular here. So yeah, awesome. that's what I think yeah. is the best best time. And also, it's unusual because it's not really about flowers yep. and stuff. It's much more about foliage, you know, yep. with the colors I mean, that's and what stuff. I'm usually all about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, there you go. You can kind of yeah kind of draw in the yeah. the foliage stuff so yeah come back in back um in late april so because all this area is is got autumn color so this was the expert section of the video <laughs> but we haven't covered the whole garden yet there's heaps more to uncover and because it was quite a drive to get out here i don't want to let any plant be unseen but I'm going to be the tour guide for the second half of the video, so there's not going to be all too much uh, information <laughs> because this is way out of my comfort zone, but yeah, let's go. Let's check it out anyway.